Hi, this is Mike. I want to talk about the continue talking about covenants and exactly what it means. Get your paper, pencil, or they're just listen along. I don't care what you do. Just so you study it, get to know it. Covenant is a very important thing, and I learned about covenant 40 years ago as I went into this. More and more about what it meant to have a covenant or be coveted with somebody and what who you could be covered with, what it really meant, and the difference between the covenant with God and with man. There's just a big difference, man to man and God to man, and how it's placed out there for you and what you're supposed to do with it. Covenant. Father, we ask you to bless us tonight as we partake of your word. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, right now, it's it's pretty strange out here in the world as we're as we're uh, as I'm watching things unfold and I'm careful about the news because you don't know what's real and what's not real anymore and there's this you know it would be different <laughs> we'll get into this I guess but it, it, it'd be different if it was just one country going through a bunch of stuff but it's not it's the whole world is going through so much turmoil and change and things are happening not good things <laughs> there's not a lot of good things happening they're challenging it seems like the whole world's being challenged to come out of the norm there's 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 a big mess going on so god's doing something it has to be the lord i always tell him you're doing something because it's you it's you that's happening this is not just the devil doing one thing in one country this is you so anyway let's start let's let's look at this and see what we can do from this yeah, and uh, it's the conviction of many thoughtful Christian men and women across the earth right now. That, as you told you, there's something going on. There's something happening here. It's distinct. It's been going on for the last 15 years, but this last year, two years, has been unique. The intercessory prayer, and, uh, praying for repentance and a spirit of repentance, prevenient grace to hit people, to get born again. Every part of the earth right now, spiritually, something, something is probably not as strong two years ago as it is now. There's something going on. Even in the fondest imagination of God lovers everywhere. It's Christians. Bible believers, you know. 10, 15 years ago, they didn't tap this, not what's going on now. No. It's obvious God's up to something. He's, he's up to something right now. <clears throat> I know he is. And like I said before, if it was happening in one country, in one culture, it would be kind of a cultural phenomenon or something happening there. But it's happening in all cultures. And we're finding out, very indeed, we're finding out that Jesus Christ is, and was, and is, the Son of Mankind. The Son of Man. He's only favorite name for himself was son of man that's what he called himself he didn't shun it but he didn't use it you know and I've, it's, several places it's like he didn't want to put anybody off he's referred to him as the son of God that turned him off of mankind so he didn't want to use it seems like to me I mean that's just the same way when he would lay hands on somebody or spit on him or whatever he did to heal him he would say you go to the priest and offer for your for your healing where you're cleansing what the law says to offer don't upset the priesthood don't upset the, we're still under the law here <clears throat> and he didn't want to lose them either i think he wanted everybody to come in and especially the priests they had held on that word so much so long it's it's very it was very important but he didn't want to hurt anybody son of man son of man son of mankind which means that that he is black and he is he's son of man he's white jesus he's a yellow jesus he's a red jesus he's brown as well he's middle eastern too he's anglo-saxon he's african he's asian he said go go everywhere he's just indian up I, I looked at this and Whatever prejudices you got inside of you, you got to let them go concerning the word. Whatever man is, whatever he is, that's he's Jesus. He's the son of man. 
the son of mankind. So his word, his incomparable word, was applicable to all men in all cultures. As I've read it and saw it for 40 years and get to know him, that's how he is. The word of God is, and God of the word, it, it applies to men universally. And what is happening in the earth tonight is extremely important that there are some of us here that, and listening, that we don't have any messianic complex or feelings that we're God's, we're God's final prophet. We're it. I have a deep anxiety and concern for, for what's happening around the world that it don't, it's not dissipated. I said before, God's pouring out his spirit right now. I hope that people don't touch, don't, I pray that the old ones don't mess with it. That the Holy Spirit does what He's going to do. I don't want to get all emotional about it, but I've been through this before. There's a depth of revelation and insight that come from the people of God about these things that mark this this outpouring. And if if, if it's not this this generation, yeah, they're going to be graced by God's manifestation. <laughs> I, I pray this generation is going more towards it than I did. And, I thought I got a lot, but the last 10 to 15 years, it's deeply, deeply entrenched doctrine, denominational doctrine, viewpoints have multiplied thousands of people, altered and changed, so they can find it in their heart to, to what's being done right now. They ran it into a corporate worship and praise, and I want to talk about this corporate. There are many of us that tried to get along corporately when the, the body of Christ and the ministries in general, I'm not going to say this with a bunch of presidents or hate or anger towards anybody. I don't. But they ran it as a business instead of running it like it's supposed to be by the Holy Spirit. They'd leave the Spirit out of certain things because, you know, he'd just mess it up. <laughs> He'll mess everything up. We can't invite him. He'd just mess it up. He'll do what he wants to do. So therefore, you know, during the service, when you want him to do certain things for you, he'll signs and wonders, which he does, to back his word and to, to glorify his name. It's not for you. They'd leave him out. He would leave them out quite often. God's not moving. You see a little thing, some headaches got healed, so forth, so on. But other big things you, you didn't see. So the corporate body... It was hard for them to get along in a utopian type of sense, if you want to call it that, where they actually visited with each other and got along with each other, instead of, you know, turn to the right and shake the hand of your brother and sister next to you, turn to the left, blah, blah, blah. Love each other, hallelujah, no, no, no. Well, that was a good start with things, but then, you know, when, when you, that's all you got, if that's it, it's not going to, there's not too much to that. And most of the pastors didn't know anybody anyway. They had, some, some churches had, Smaller fellowships and cell meetings, cell groups where they do some communion. But there is a there is a communion here that's coming. It's just going to be this last move. It's just not going to be just single superstars showing up doing their thing, and millions coming into the kingdom of God. That's happened. And that will happen. The Lord has called many to do certain things. But I think more than anything else, right now, the world's not going to know that we are loved by Christ. Not going to know we're Christians unless we love one another. He talked about us as the body of Christ loving one another a lot. He talked about communion a lot. And it wasn't just taking the blood and the body of Christ. And that was our personal communion we had with Jesus. We had a communion with people, with one another. Paul said that in Corinthians. You're not taking communion right. Some of you are drunk over here. Some of you are eating over here while others are starving over there. And, you know, by the time a thing gets rolling around, half of you are drunk and the rest of you are, you know, angry, mad about this. And some of you sleep, some of you are dead, you know, and you wonder why. It's because they didn't understand the union that they're supposed to have together in one spirit. as one people. And that's, that's hard. Don't, don't get me wrong, that's hard to do. There's a lot of the pastorate, shepherds and pastors are the same thing. Apostles and prophets, yeah, yes, they do have a. Uh, they are lifted up in certain ways, but they're they aren't any better than anybody else. 
When you have a thousand people pulling at you at one time, I understand the pressures that you might have upon you not even remembering anybody. Or if you've been, uh, uh, I don't know if a lot of people understand this, there's a few Pentecostals do, and Charismatics, uh, some some Baptists, You and I'm just being plain forward about it. I've always been plain forward about everything. After they come off of that anointing, I've watched them where I had tip two or three men to carry them off. That anointing just wears them out. Men and women just wore them flat out. Oh, they would minister in the Lord of things from heaven. And that power and that unction would flow out and those words would be covered with the Holy Spirit. And by the time they were done, an hour and a half, two hours into it, it's over. I've seen some pray for people four or five hours and they should be exhausted. They have to take the next two weeks off. Or they cut their life short because <laughs> they're constantly going. And when they hit about 60 years old, everything on them falls apart. Because that anointing fooled them in some ways. It's power. It just keeps them fooled. R.W. Schoenbach, who was a wonderful minister, and I just love to listen to him. He was out of the field ministering and preaching. And he's an evangelist, and he just brought him in. And his personal doctor called his daughter and called him, too, and said, You need to come in for a checkup right away. I just sense he's a Christian man. I sense inside, I just have a sensing more and more that you're supposed to be in here now. And he said, I can't, Doc. I've got so many things to do. His sister's daughter called him and said, you get in here? Something going on. I sense it too. So he went to the doctor and he needed a triple bypass. He didn't even feel it. He didn't know. He was about to drop dead. That anointing was on him so often, so much. When it hit you, I've, 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 I had the flu once. I never had colds and flu much at all. I believe God and my body was didn't it just didn't have that didn't, didn't well, I don't have it I haven't had the flu I go through all this mess that's going on right now and didn't have any of it coronavirus and all the rest of it I've been around a lot of people who haven't had the flu in years and a cold or anything else but I had the flu one evening and I was asked to go minister I said I, I can't get to go inside it was like you got to go so I went and as soon as I stepped up to to start ministering. All the symptoms of that cold and flu and all that mess left. Gone. No more pain, no more hurt, no more anything. I had a covenant with the Lord. Do his work. Be anointed by him and empowered by him. And it would leave. But then after I stepped down, about half hour afterwards, ministered for about two hours, all of it came back and it rode through for the next couple of days. I always got rid of it a little early, but but it was there. So I want to talk about this this. This uh, communion with each other. And we, uh, we need to look at that. Look at the fourth chapter of Ephesians. The order of our ultimate un uh, unity is this. First, we need to do everything in our power to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. This fourth chapter of Ephesians says this. It says that we're having an, our hearts together and keep the unity of the Spirit. We must move towards the unity of the faith. Now, we've had kind of everything backwards, which was, you know, that's what we do. But that's what we tend to do that and is inherent in humanity anyway. And we Christians will get together when we all believe the same. Ah, no, that was never the divine intention. And I haven't seen it in 40 years. We get together, first of all, because of the common submission to the Lordship of Christ. That we're supposed to have, which is sealed by the Holy Spirit, in which we're brought into a common relationship with God and with one another. Then we begin to find out what it's about. You can't do any of that until you come in that door. Find out by our renewed mind. And God's ultimate is that we shall all speak the same thing, the same language, the same, be on the same page. Isaiah says, when Messiah's best day, we shall eye to eye in Zion. I wouldn't hinder that by say it's impossible. Don't do that. If God said it's possible, then it's going to happen. It's just going to happen. I don't know when, but it will happen. There are many things that will blow our minds the next several years. As I see God moving and doing things, because he's doing stuff. that I, He's done a lot of things that I thought was impossible. And for the simple reason, we didn't believe God. Now we're seeing to see God doing things that we didn't think was possible and and I like it. I've watched it through different churches and different things where people start listening to the Lord and actually doing what He wants done 
And it's shocking to the congregation. It's shocking to the pastor. It's shocking to people. But it's the Lord. And it's wonderful. And you can't have any more revelation when you start, if you, until you start doing what he wants done. Communion. Uh, the preference that I want to bring to you is this. I stopped preaching sermons a long time ago. I don't. And, and uh, I want to teach more than anything this last while, but I don't know preaching. Harmonics is kind of out and putting together a sermon anymore. I stopped doing that. I don't sermonize much anymore. I just don't do it. My heart is concerned with the message to the body of Christ and the people that will listen. My heart's burdened with a desire to see the will of God done in earnest as it is in heaven, on earth. Now, among many things that the Lord has quickened to me this last two years or so, is the desire, and it bothered me, but it is born in my heart more and more, covenant, and different kinds of covenants. And we deal technically with a covenant. We did the last time we talked. To, but this is what I want to bring when I'm doing this series is covenant where it comes from and I'm going to put it on a human basis for a moment let's look at it and we'll do this before I started it the um let's see how can I do this right I think that we're probably all concerned with our um our horizontal divisions more than our vertical I think more than and our horizontal divisions, that unchristian attitude towards one another, even within the profession Christian, Christian community, which I've seen so often, it derives from the fact that we don't have, uh, we haven't taken with profound sincerity and dedication the fact that we will relate to each other loyal as loyally as faithful too, and lovingly as meaningfully as we relate to God. That's all I can say about it. That all of our horizontal relationships are an expression of our vertical relationship. Period. And that's what I have seen. And that I believe. I don't wish to trust any man in a relationship with me any further than that man can be trusted with his relationship with God. Period. If you'll cheat on God, you'll cheat on me. If you... Pay, play fast and loose with your relationship with Jesus Christ, you won't hesitate to sell me down the river or throw me under the bus. I know what you'll do. And as we've seen this relationship message taught more and more and realize it more and more, the, one of the most very significant dimensions of what God is doing is we're supposed to be brought into a meaningful relationship with one another. I see that. I, I see that God is forming community. The body of Jesus Christ is coming into formation. I know he's doing that. He must have a corporate Christ in the earth. Now, I don't... American. I just have to say this. I've been around the world. Americans are, are the stub most stubborn, non-submitted people to each other and to other things than I've ever seen. Individuals. Kings and queens, for sure. <laughs> they won't. They won't submit to one. They'll go for as far as they can go. But if you look like... In any way that anything about you is being threatened by somebody, whoever, whatever it may be, then you'd have to be, uh, you'd have to sacrifice somewhat for your brothers and sisters. Oh, no, you're not going to. You'll throw everybody under the bus. You'll throw everybody out to save your own soul, to save your own whatever kingdom, whatever you think you've built up or what God gave you. It's your loyalty to one another and to the body of Christ in that covenant that you have with them through Christ, through the Lord, doesn't mean anything to you. And when it comes right down to it, push come to shove, you will not take a hurt, no matter what. You think you're supposed to get something out of it. I've seen this. Given it shall be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. With good measure, men shall give in your bosom. So you'll give everything away or do everything when you think you're getting something back or using your faith. Faith should be left out. I'm preaching again. Here we go. I think the, there's a wonderful, magnificent Jesus who strolled across the stage of history. He left an indelible mark as a, an interracial. It's not erase it, but you can't erase it. It's there. It's a posture for all history. And it's being reproduced now in many lives. But it's only as those lives are in the corporate community and completely sold out to Jesus. Sold out. 
They have to give to the Lord. They have to give to each other. If you don't, there's something going to be missing. Now, as you come into this corporate community, you got to first understand our relationship to God we have. You've got to understand that. I think we all see the uni unity need right now. It's just really need to be united. The expressions of the world, yeah, it's everywhere. United Nations, Universal, it's potpourri of, of fighting and scrapping and confronting nations to gather together in one place called the United Nations, which didn't work anyway, with the hope that somehow that they could get it together long enough to not kill each other. And uh, they're everlastingly not working. It's constantly fighting. And incidentally, the world knows what you and I should be, which they do. They will say it. And we've said it before. How? You can't do this. But they know Christians should not be fighting. And they know that. The world somehow knows the nature of ultimate reality cannot be war. It's not war. It's just not. I... Uh, I have served my time in the military. I know about war. And I, I can't... I'm a military man, a man of authority. I belong to Jesus. There's nothing good come out of war. Not, uh, not a thing other than destroying evil. That's about it. Everything is destroyed. It's confusion. It's a mess. It's, just, it's messy. It's nasty. Not supposed to be... There's nothing good in war. And it's just insanity. War is just insane. If, if, and those of you who have been in, in the military know what I mean. So this everlasting quest for peace and desire for unity is, is uh, science itself says that. They're committed to a universe, uni. <laughs> they speak about the relationship, uh, inner relationship of, of laws that govern the universe. That whatever may be the motivating cause of our universe, the universe itself springs from something that has a unitive power and concept design come from God. Well, a lot of people don't think so, but it is. The world of universes. The world is a universe. Now, there's something in the universe that cries out for, for the dissipation of destruction. This ultimate disappearance of all these divisions, all this mess. Everything screams us to be one. That's why I think there's going to be such a illusionally delusion. Now we know that the world doesn't have the equipment to bring it to power. That's why it's going to be such a fake mess. The very nature of, of this is as a seed of destruction. Unregenerated man cannot find each other because there's war in their hearts, hate in their hearts, division in their hearts. Now their heads tell them there ought not to be war. They don't have the moral fiber nor power to, to have it come to pass. The agitation in their own heart's too hard. They come out worried when they intend to talk about uniting. But it's not so with Christians. It's not supposed to be. We're the children of peace. He said that. We've been born into the family of the Prince of Peace. He said that. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Peace. We must be a people of peace. And we need to be an example of peace. We need to be a community of peace. We must offer the world an alternative, an option, because they've run out of options. The world, you look around right now, there's nowhere to go. The world has come to the climax of history now. They've come to the ultimate cul-de-sac. The there are no roads, no side roads. Ah, you're going to hit there. No escape hatches, no nothing. You're at the end economically, politically, sociologically. The world has run out of options. They're not here anymore. They're not here. And I think the world is ready for the display of God's community, men and women. They are, but they can't be stupid. But it involves our understanding of covenants. You have to understand that. Covenants basic to the whole approach to man. That was God. The Bible is in two parts. The Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Which, in its simplest definition, is telling us that the Bible is, is God's word to mankind. It's as simple as that. And this morning we quickly look at the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word is bereaf. 
it's entomology, as we've said before, is shrouded in kind of mystery. It is to me. And research deals it more and more that the, basically the word berif means this. It's the Hebrew word for covenant. It speaks of a binding. Senesine. Uh, it's a passing of official decree. I'm reading this. It involves the word of authority of a judge. Uh... Uh, word of authority come from a judge sending a criminal, citizen to whatever. This authority, it comes from an absolute monarch, authority. He declares a word of authority becomes law to his subject, pow. When his word is given to God, by God, it stands first of all, for the fact that God has broken into time, space, world and talked to his man. He's communicated his mind and his will and his purpose with irrational creatures that he created in his mind, which is us. It also has in it the word, the meaning of sacrifice, which is the secondary meaning, both in the word and in the uh, evolution of history down through time. What requires the second meaning is history. The third meaning is inherited in the word. Brief is eating, a covenant meal. And uh, we'll see how this three meanings they have a kind of a sort of an ongoing application as history breaks out of the Garden of Eden and into a long, prost out journey, journey of sin, need for a second application and a third application as men through the bud of covenant are called back to the Word of God and then sit down for a covenant meal and to fellowship with one another on the sacrificial meal that was given to them and declare their restoration and redemption that God has given to them as they eat together in a community of the redeemed. I see that as I read it more and more. As we come into the New Testament, the word that you chosen there has been diaseke. I'm reading this. It stands in opposition to the word sunseke. Now prefixes are different as you can hear. Sunseke speaks of an arrangement, a pact between two equals. It's never used in the covenant of God, ever. It's interesting as you read the Bible, and it constantly speaks of my covenant. God says, my covenant. He doesn't talk about our covenant. It's my covenant that I made with them. It's my covenant. My covenant. My covenant you have broken. My covenant. Now God calls us into a covenant relationship with him. But he calls the shots and calls the tune. He sets the, the terms. He writes the clauses. He delivers every demand. It's him. We found out from the Greek word diaseke, without laboring it too hard into this, but I'm not going to recap it hard, but we found from diaseke that it can be reduced to this, reduced. That what God has spoken in his covenantal word, you may accept it, you may reject it, but you can't alter it. Now, we've said that last time. Now, let's say it together. Let's, let's do it together. It'll come up again more and more. You may accept it you may reject it you cannot alter it i heard you now say it again <laughs> it's god's covenant not yours it's not our covenant we we can't add to it or, we can't do it with it even when i receive it i receive it as god's covenant this is my covenant the lord says my new covenant this is my blood of my new covenant that's what he said so if the covenant is always God's covenant, it's God moving towards man in, in, in love and mercy, in redemption, in compassion, in, in structure, and in order, in discipline too. Yes, it requires a response from man. It requires one of obedience. Just as simply obey him. That's simple. That was the covenant. That is the covenant. I wish the word faith would go on a temporary hiatus. Just leave for a while. Faith. Oh, it's faith, faith, faith. Faith has become so many things that are not. It's not real faith. And I can say that now after many years. I've heard so much. Now, for a little while, we put faith to the side and put obedience instead of faith. I think we do a lot more for each other. More favor to yourself. The great epistle of Romans, where the Apostle Paul 
is giving us a systematic revelation of how God faces in them. He says that we're justified by faith, but he doesn't suggest, he never suggested, but that faith is an intellectual act, an excellence is a decree, some kind of superstitious weirdness, credulity. He speaks of it three times, like the obedience of faith. It is God's word of man that requires a response from man to acknowledge the right of God to govern man's lives, to govern your lives. There's one more thing about this. For every time the Bible speaks of Christ as Savior, it speaks 29 times of Him as Lord. And yet, in my lifetime, I constantly hear this and have people appealed to to receive Christ as their Savior. Huh. I'd be hard put and hard pressed. Text that says, I can't find one where it says, Receive Christ as your Savior. When over and over and over again, we're called to confess this as Lord. That means not only does it come to us as a friendship blood to take away the guilt and penalty of our sins, but He comes to us as Master. Yes, to take the Greek word, which is despotes, let's give it an English equivalent as a benign despot. That's how he comes to you. He says to you, I will take your mangled, distorted, misused life, and I, by my blood, will legally forgive you your sins, your trespasses, all your violations of the law, but I will, from that moment on, I'll require from you, I want your life to be put in my hands, that I should govern it in Entirely, and that for a moment that you turn your life over to me, at, as Lord, receiving my saving, forgiving grace and mercy, from that time on, from that time on, you shall never, that time on, you shall never determine anything on your own. You shall do that which I command you, which my ways for you are the best, the better of all, bestest. I not only save you from your sin, I'll save you from the. The thing that produced your sin. You. The twisted, warped, disoriented self that you have become. I will now come into that self. And I will not only reside, but I will crucify it. I'll, I will be resident. I will be president, not only resident. I will reign from the throne of your spirit. And I will remove your mind. I will establish within you a, a renewed mind. A whole new set of thought patterns of my word, which are expressed in a whole new set of behaviors and behavior patterns, which will make you my children. In very deed, I come to master you. I've come to be the king of all. I'll be the Lord of lords, all lords, that's you. If you're king of your own life, I've come to displace you and make be the king. If you're the Lord of your own destiny, I've come to replace you. I'm going to be your Lord and destiny. I'll give myself to you as your Lord to forever, evermore, to govern inside and direct your life. And so, so much better you'll have no idea. Some people come to Christ as a fire escape. They come to Christ as an insurance policy. And carry that notice around in your wallet. There, next to your heart. They'll produce it at different times, you know. This is when I got saved. And certain night I raised my hands and I received Christ then as Savior. And I automatically got my little card that says I'm going to heaven. And I produce it. And I don't mean to upset everybody unnecessarily. But if you're going to get upset, it's going to be that does it. I'll upset you. I don't mind to do it. I'll be the one to do it. Yeah. I think that we need to take a good hard look at, at what it means to be a Christian. Now, I have said that for years. If being a Christian, that's me too. If not, it's not my my being, being a Christian doesn't mean that I'm going to do God a big favor. I get, I get irritated by it. Buddy buddies. I hear people appeal to it as if they appeal to people. Jesus is desperate. He wants you as his buddy. No, he doesn't. Please do come forward. Please. He won't make it hard for you. Really, if you just come forward, that's about all you have to do. Get your card. You'll be all ready. Yeah, you'll present it any time. And be sure you have it when you die. That's the most important thing. Have it when you're dead. Dying.
and introduce the whole thing to a character, a mess. Not real. What I'm saying tonight is this. That God is God, and beside him there's no other. And his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, has the government of the universe on his shoulders. Pretty big. And the blessed Holy Spirit, by God, he's the one who, who dots the will of the Son and puts it in the earth. And he does it. And he moves about the sons of men to press the plains of God's righteous government here and there. I tell you, here and there, when we lost the gospel of the kingdom, and the nonsense of a novelty of theology that I've watched so often, less than 200 years, they, we lose the vitalness and the vitality of the gospel and the strength and the, the juice of the, the good news. Jesus Christ is the governor of, of men. He is the God of men. The Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. He come to take it. In you know, 12th chapter of Romans, I beseech you therefore the mercies of God, Paul said, that you yield to your bodies as yield a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may know by experience what is that good and perfect will of, of God, acceptable to God. Now, that's an interesting passage, but when Paul said this is your reasonable service, he meant it, reasonable. He uses the Greek word there, which is only used twice in the entire New Testament. Lodikos. It means this, that which is suitable for a sound mind. What Paul is saying is, I beseech you, brethren, be sensible, rational. Do the sanest thing you could ever done. You can't, you can't do anything saner and sounder for any reason, anywhere, than to give your life totally over to Jesus Christ, over to the God who made everything, heavens and earth and stars and dogs and cats, to have it run you, he wants to run your life. Don't be stupid. Take the deal. When it's offered to you by the Holy Spirit, take it. Don't be dumb. I mean, people just look, they look dumbfounded. I'll lead people to Christ or hold a, a call. And, and I, I don't say come, come, to the, come to the Lord and everything will be perfect for you. I do not say that. But I'll look at them and they've had the gospel preached to them. And they have the Holy Spirit speaking to them. Uh, give your life to me and so forth. And they look dumb. Dumbfounded. I, I've asked a couple. What are you going to do? What is so important? What kind of sin are you going to do? That is so magnificently more important than eternal life and forever living with Christ. And have him actually straighten you out. It's going to take a few years to undo certain things. But it's going to be an ongoing thing. And then he'll give, he's going to give you eternity. Things are going to happen to you for the rest of your eternal life. Which is no time at that point. That you would have never dreamed. You're not going to be a little God. You, you have God is going to be your God. You're a creature. But you're going to be just like Jesus. That's what Paul said. That's what Peter said. That's what everybody said. We don't know who we are yet. We don't know everything that's put under our dominion. We know what's been put under our dominion on the earth. But not after we receive spirit and bone and flesh. No blood. That'd be gone. Jesus walked through walls. He appeared here and there. He lived 40 days with the disciples and taught them for 40 days afterwards. There were people that resurrected and walked around Jerusalem, hadn't seen the old town for a while. We asked the Lord if they could go, go talk to Billy. He did. And then they flew away. Can you imagine you flying away? And those of you that have tasted the good things of God and the Holy Spirit, the wonderful powers of God, the things to be, the precious word, the Holy Spirit, then you know what I'm talking about. It's coming. That's a precious price. I have brothers and sisters that have never hardly sensed the Holy Spirit. They have the Word of God to hang on. They had that new birth. It hit them. That might have been 30 years. And I've asked them, have you ever heard from God? And one, and there was a, uh, a room, about 40 people in it. And the pastor that night was asking people if they had ever heard from the Holy Spirit. And there were two. One that raised their hand and said, I had a dream from him about 20 years ago. Another one raised their hand and said, I heard him about 15 years ago. And I felt embarrassed because I hear the Lord at least once a week. I listen to him. I learn, train up my spirit, and hear what he has to say and how he wants to lead me. Because he said he talked to Adam in the garden in the cool of the evenings. Well, I know he wants to commune with me. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are his sons. That's me. That's what I wanted more than anything else. Covenant's important. Covenant. 
And he was talking about you giving yourself to the Holy Spirit, a covenant, a, a discipline, a sword. It was the smartest thing that you could ever do. Why would you do this? And what he's saying is, it's long enough you run yourself into the ground. You've tried to make a life for yourself and you keep messing it up. Yeah, unless the devil is just giving you everything. But with average people, you make a mess out of things. Let me take it over. Jesus is saying, let me run it. Best deal you can get. That's what Paul's saying. Be the best thing that ever happened. Best thing. Now, let me start out this morning. Why the covenant's necessary. And the first thing we said was the creature creator, or the creator creature creator relationship, the breath of every living creature is in his hand. If God closes great fists, it just crush everything. All this would be done. All the body of humanity would be crushed with one little pressure. That's how big he is, as strong he is. He's so big, bigger than that. He's a breath of every living creature. It's in the Word. We're completely dependent on God anyway. Therefore, the God is the Creator, and he has the absolute right to do what he wants. From He demands demand from man what he wants. So there's a response to obedience of his decree. Respond. So when the Adam in the garden came to him, and he placed man in the ideal situation in the beautiful garden. I don't think he made an ugly garden. He made a beautiful garden in the midst of an unfallen world. Put it by his side, an exquisite creature, beautiful next to him. I want you to multiply, replenish the earth, and fill the earth with beautiful people, beautiful creatures like you. Take it over. And I'm equip you. In the Garden of Eden, he equipped him with how to subdue the earth and bring it into God's order. He saw, saw that. Now, this is God's covenant word to Adam. He covenanted with Adam. He told him, this is what I want. Now, God had broke that covenant word, and God, and God put him out of the garden. Now, as God was, Adam was put out of the garden, God spoke again covenantly, covenantially, coming down to the garden with the occasion of Adam's disobedience. You remember the conversation? Adam, where are you? Adam, Adam said, I was afraid and I was hiding. I'm behind a tree. Sin makes you stupid. We <laughs> get stupid. Hide behind, hide behind a tree from God. That's smart. Just <laughs> I, I hid. I was afraid, and I hid. Now those are the first words of all a man. I'm afraid. Up until this time, it wasn't a fear. No one didn't even know what fear was. But suddenly, having to eat the forbidden fruit, which whatever it was, whatever broke, he broke God's covenant word. He found himself psychologically and emotionally. As he'd never been before. Something happened. He got stupid. Uh, furthermore, him and Eve were ashamed inside each other's nakedness, which up to this time, they had no shame. Because shame is associated with sin. So they had no sin. They caught with, covered with God's obedience and glory. They had no need to cover their nakedness. They weren't ashamed. It wasn't there. No sin. So, God said, Adam, Adam, you know where you are, Adam? You know what you've done? You're at the fountainhead of the human race, Adam. And this one act of disobedience will throw all of your prodigy, progeny into a state of unrighteousness, Adam. And for that one sin, Adam, and God drove him out of the garden for that one sin. Now, as he drove garden and drove Adam out of the garden, he wasn't finished by any means. He didn't call it a day. Let's call it quits. It's been a rough one. No, he said, God pronounced judgment on, on Eve. Because when he spoke to Adam, Adam said, it wasn't me, it was the woman you gave me. Threw her under the bus first thing. <laughs> Incidentally, he was pretty glad to get her when he got her, if you remember correctly. Who? Uh, but sin only makes us just not even stupid, it's dumb and fearful. It makes us cowardly and deceptive. And none of us want to take the responsibility for our own actions, do we? There needs to be a restoration of God's moral law. That makes us to know that that every one of us, when we stand ultimately before the throne of God, will give an account of our loyalty and our responsibility as moral creatures. And we can't keep saying the devil made me do it, the wife made me do it, the husband made me do it, my friends made me do it. We're going to have to stand there totally responsible for your conduct as rational, moral human beings in a moral universe that God gave us. This needs to be restored to us. I've said that for 40 years. 
the whole rotten sociological Freudian concept that has riddled the society. You know, this cop outs and social mess exercise. Tell me about your sin. They need to be exercised this. They need to be brought back. People need to be brought back to the stand of, of moral reality. You don't want to stand before God immorally thinking that you're righteous. No, you have to give an account with the life that God has gave to you as a gift. Especially the moral and loyal attitude that you're supposed to have. Now the fact that your father abused you, your mother forsook you, that you fell down a manhole, I got hurt by kicked by a horse, everything happened, went wrong. I milked the cow and they kicked me over too and on and on and on. Look, so what? Let's go, go on. God didn't stop to argue the case with anybody. He just pronounced his judgment. You couldn't say anything to him. He pronounced his judgment on Eve. And But Eve was deceived, right? Well, guess what? We all need to really take this in and learn hard. If you're deceived tonight, if you're deceived, you are uh, guilty. You're, you're guilty of having been deceived. Because you couldn't have been deceived if you would have done what God said. If you would walk in the Lordship of Christ, you won't be deceived. The fact that we can be deceived indicates to me that there's an area in our life that is not submitted to the Lordship of Christ. You, know, you, can't, you can't blame the deceiver on that. Now the serpent was a deceiver on this. While the serpent was judged for having deceived Eve... He didn't get Eve off the hook. Eve was judged because she got deceived. She knew, Adam told her, she was responsible for the condition that allowed the deception. And then she deceived Adam as well. She was, she was the, it was open for her to, to deceive. So it was all judged. The judgment was pushed on all three at that time. God drove the man out too. But before he drove him out, in his denunciation of the serpent, he said, he told him, the lines are drawn here, bud. There a day will come when the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head, you. I myself will put enmity between you and, and the seed of the woman. Oh, so God has spoken again. That's another greed, decree. God's covenantal word comes once word to man, once more in his fallen condition, and there's a new dimension in it now. Now before he simply said, Adam, I gave you the garden. I want you to look after it. And I want you to guard it. And don't touch that fruit of that tree. Just leave that tree alone. Now that's the total law right there. All of it was covenant law. Now man violated it. And he put out of the garden. And there's a new dimension to it too. But you have to really start thinking about it. Now the first thing that Adam and Eve did when they saw their nakedness was try to cover their guilt. Cover it up. So they made for themselves aprons. <laughs> they didn't make hats, no sweaters, no dresses, no gloves, no shoes. They made aprons to cover their private parts. The parts that are recreative. And the reproduction organs. That's what they covered up. Did you ever wonder up why throughout the Bible is such a such a sensitive of sex and great penalties with sex? Boy, why, why is this a society that goes permissive and where it really breaks through most of all, most frequently of all, frequently, 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 sex. Number one, the sex act of procreation brings man close, closest to his godliness, his godlikeness, as he reproduces his own kind in the mystery of procreation. <laughs> it is. But symbolically, the reproductive organs, it stands symbolically for the secret core of your being. The deepest, most intimate area of your life, of who you are. Your inner commitment who you are and, and to God and those around you. It's private, secret. And Adam and Eve had come out of underneath the covering of God in his authority. And they were naked and they knew they were naked. They knew that something was wrong inside of them, between them and God, and between themselves, too. Something had changed them and went wrong between each other. And they tried to cover that up. 
Oh, what a mess. They were uncovered. Why? Now God ignored their fig leaf apron. He didn't like that anyway. He ignored it. After he pronounced judgment on them, they stood back out of the way and they watched him. He just looked at what he's about to do. And God grabbed an animal. And up until this time, there'd been no death and no, been no mess. Just life everywhere. And it was perfect, and harmonious, and tranquil. Beautiful. It was lovely. There was no gnarled knots on the trees, no dead grass, no strange weeds growing, nothing. Just no aspect of the curse whatsoever. There wasn't one. They had never seen death. They didn't know what it was. I've talked about this before. But now in this whole terrible dialogue they were having with God, it's become necessary because of man's breaking God's covenantal word. God reaches down and grabs an animal. And with one death movement, he cuts the throat of that animal and blood all over the ground. Right in front of him. All over Adam and Eve stand back and just wonder, oh my gosh, what have we done? And one more death stroke, he skins the animal. And with his hot breath, he, he tans it up for him. And then he, just as he made man and woman, with skillful fingers, he makes that garment for him. It covers them both up. Covers them up. With a garment made of an animal of blood. And it cost them. It was the price of blood. Right away, and they learned their first lesson in redemption, in covenantal relationship right there. And God did it. Now, God drives them from the garden. The Hebrew word there is interesting. Do you ever wonder how people said things in the Bible? I always did when I walked with them, how Jesus said this, and how David said this, and how the prophet said this. And it piques my curiosity because I've been in movements where where I would have people prophesy or speak the word of God or say something. And depending on, on their heart and depending on their spirit and their soul at times. That they may say the word of God, but it won't come out right. They may deliver the word of God and it's bitter. It's angry. God wasn't bitter and anger. Remember when he told Moses, I want you to speak to that rock. And he didn't. He, he hid it because he was mad. And God said, well, you didn't represent me properly. You didn't say it properly. And you didn't have the right spirit when you said it. You're not going in the promised land. The the penalties for doing those things were pretty harsh. And Jesus said, I do what my father shows me and I do it the way he shows it to me. He, his inflections were the same. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. If you've seen the father, you've seen me. So he, he copied everything. And that's what I'm trying to tell you right now. How did God talk? What, what did he talk? In Saul of Tarsus, when he was thrown down on the road, how, how did Jesus speak to him? I wonder that. But he, Saul, Saul, what's wrong with you? You persecuting me? Oh, I don't think he did it. I didn't say it that way. I don't think he did it at all. No. I don't. You know, a lot of people say, you know, what are you, what are you doing, Mike? No, it's a beautiful passage in John. And if John said that, at all times he said what the Father told him to say, and the and the way, not only that, he, again, I tell you, not only what the Father told me to say, but the way the Father told me to say it. Exactly. The inflections. And I said before, you can say it true, but say it in the wrong spirit. And it's wrong error. It's error. You can feel it. Error. And that may be cool, true in content, but his delivery was bad. Bad source. And sometimes light. I mean, the words just fall on the ground. They're not able to strength. Your spirit's wounded. Something's wrong. I think when believe what God drove man from the garden, that he he had a tear in his eye, and he did it gently. He didn't want to do it. Imagine that. You made those beautiful people. The tears running down his cheeks. you got to go. You have to go and, and prod them out. Get on out. I don't think he threw lightning bolts at them. They were protesting, too, like kids do. Well, one small thing. we well, got to go. Yeah, you got to go. Yeah. Yep, yeah, you got to go. We have to leave. Yes, you got to leave. You got to get out of here. My covenantal word, it cannot be broken. It's just like, it's my word has it in it, the, the power, it has teeth. My word has teeth, sanction in it. I warned you in the day that you ate thereof, 
dying would, 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 would happen immediately. I told you what my word would do. Power in that word. And it would start in that moment. And it did. Immediately. He upholds all things by the word. Power is word. Not the word of, the word of his power, excuse me. The Bible said in the King James Version, it said that he set cherubim with flaming swords to guard that, that path back into the tree of life. He said, don't let him in there. Now, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, and commentaries, they had a suggestive translation that said this. He got at the garden, and he set up an altar. And out there. And the cherubim who that was in the tabernacle over that over that altar for that cherubim, they're the guarders of the anointing, guardians of holiness. They they guard guard God's holiness. And it was in the center of those cherubim was the mercy seat as well. But a flaming sword was there. Uh, back and forth and back and forth. The presence of God. Right there. Right at the door of human failure. Right at that eastern gate. You can see the mercy seat was there too, like that. Right at that point, God speaks there, covenantally. That's where you put your sacrifice. This time it's not thou shalt not eat of the fruit of the tree of, 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 of evil and good. You're going to avail yourself now of the, res the covenantal purpose that I've showed you the way back to me. It's by blood, right there. It's by the covering of my provisions. The altar at the eastern gate has become the first place of redemption. In my, when you look at that, it's not in my opinion. It's how it is. And Cain and Abel were there too. They were taught. God taught them, and they Adam taught, taught them the awfulness of God, the holiness of God. And he was standing right there in the shadow, the shelter of that altar, that they recited the story of the beautiful things Adam would tell him about what happened in the garden, how wonderful it was, and what happened. And as the little lads listened to what they had to say, and they recounted to them the, the horrible day when they messed it up, what that snake did, and how he did it. Now it's different now. And sons, we have to do this here now. We come to God, and God spoke to them too. We don't cock to them in the cool evening. You must come to him now with sacrifice right there on that altar, where those cherubim are, and that sword from the back and forth. That's why Cain and Abel stand out mostly for what they did in the first illustration of of those who obeyed and violated God's covenant of word in the new dimension that was given to them. Wow. Cain was of the evil one. Simple. That means that Cain was seduced and deceived by the the same thing that happened to Eve. Satan got him too. Uh, Abel, he was a believer. He believed it. And Abel brought his lamb. Because he knew. He recognized that it needed to be blood. His covenantal purposes. A life for a, a life. He knew that. But Cain, with <laughs> protozoan ants, I'll bring on my, my spinach and my carrots and my whatever. I'm going to offer that to God and it should be good enough. My, my, me, me, my, mine. He rejected him. And he rejected him. And that's it. He rejected it. Now, he didn't reject the offering of Cain. He didn't accept the offering of Abel. Of Abel. It doesn't matter what I am as long as my offering is right, right? Oh, it does matter. He didn't reject the offerings. He rejected the people. The offering is a manifestation of what you are. Cain brought the product of his own hands. I've seen this not only in this in this type of of uh, thinking, but in the church of people who tithe and give. There are so many people that tithe out of their nothing. They give trash. They will never give their best. They don't want because they don't think that. To a, a ministry or a body. You're tithing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's alive. In the order of Melchizedek. Forever and ever. You bring your tithes to the storehouse. There may be meat in my house. Those things needed to be done properly. In your covenant as well. And God was looking at the men's heart. He wasn't looking at what they were given. Although that's the part. 
It was a blood sacrifice, blood for blood. He doesn't want your gross or your produce that you grew yourself. He works with your own hands. But he was in rebellion against God. He refused to bring a bloody sacrifice. He wouldn't do it. Abel's heart was right towards God. And he brought the product of his flock. And he shed his blood right there. Now, uh, I think we touched about that this morning, or yesterday. Hosea, Hosea said, I don't want your sacrifices. No, I don't want your sacrifices. You bring your hypo-Christianity to me and your double-dealing heart to me, I don't want that. Don't come to me with fornication in your heart and sacrificial blood in your hands. It's no good, doesn't mean nothing to me. Don't come to me and try to bribe me, con me, to make me believe me that you love me and do my will. But superfluous and superficial, meaningless religious acts that you do towards me when your heart's not committed to me. Give me your heart. Give me your heart. So there was a new covenantal word. Now, if we go to Genesis, you go to chapter 9 of Genesis and look for a moment for another covenant with Noah. We're going to do that the next time with Noah. Father, we just praise you and thank you for this covenant that you made. We didn't get very far, but we did a little preaching. Bless your people. Now loose the anointing over them. Their thought life, their mind. They see a, uh, see the strength of this covenant, what covenant means as we go through this. It'll be two or three, four or five teachings maybe on covenant down through time. The Noahic covenants, we're going to cover this next time, uh, part of it. And what it means, man to man, the seriousness of the covenant that God had with us and what he said that we had with each other as well, and with animals as well. What he wouldn't do and what he was going to do. It was something new, a new covenant with that, with Noah. Now, Father, we thank you. We worship you in Jesus' name. Well, listen to it again. It's pretty good. This is Mike. We'll see you next time. And Jesus is Lord.